Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode with me, Gisela K. This is Grizzly True Crime, and today we are going to be breaking down the latest Dateline episode featuring the legendary Keith Morrison about the Idaho College murders and Brian Koberger, the suspect that was arrested. Now, I see a lot of people, firstly, a lot of people haven't watched it yet. I believe it's on NBC, but anyway... Um, I'm not sure why I haven't watched it, but what I've heard is people are not interested in watching it because they're like, well, what's interesting about it? And there's nothing new. And that seems to be a bit of the narrative going there. But I found some things in that documentary quite interesting. So I've made a little presentation for us. As you know, I love to do <laughs> love bullet points, love the presentation. So we're going to look at some of those points. Um, I've also got notes here just to discuss some of that so thank you so much uh for being here really appreciate it if you haven't yet please like the episode and share it so that others can know that we are live right now discussing it um i see lots of discussion going on on twitter also thank you to the person who before i could see it like on nbc or anywhere it's a little bit hard even with a vpn they screen recorded it for me so that I could actually watch it and sent it to me, which I think was very, very sweet. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You know who you are. Um, so we're not going to be watching it because that's an immediate copyright strike. Like I'm not here to take my channel down all in one day. We're going to be discussing notes on the episode. So I would highly recommend that you find a place to watch the episode. Okay. So maybe this will make you want to watch it. Yes. And this is no sponsor, no promo. Maybe it'll make you want to watch it after we discuss a few things. I just quickly want to remind you guys that uh, there are new documents that are posted on my community tab. Let me quickly show you this, which over here, sorry, I'm like squinting. I'm trying to see the small screen. Um, over here, we've got Brian Koberger being arraigned on Monday. Now, he's been indicted by a grand jury. I did a little episode recap for you guys. So if you haven't seen that video, I think I, I launched that yesterday, yes? Um, so go and check that out. The only note I made there in the pinned comments and in the description box is that the stats that I shared from the article, their stats are based on a federal grand indictment, and this is a state grand indictment. So that would be the difference there. So I don't know what the stats are for a state grand indictment, but yes, he's been indicted by a grand jury, and he's going to be arraigned on Monday. This starts at 9 o'clock. Now, in case everybody's like, are we going to stream it? Are we going to see it? We can't see it. There's three meetings. Number one, one at nine o'clock. At 10 o'clock, there is a scheduling conference. And then at 11 o'clock, there's a motions hearing. Okay. And what they said here is the order regarding the notice of hearing Zoom information. When I saw Zoom, I'm like, oh, yes, we're going to be able to see it. Okay. Then they say here, the court is mindful that limited courtroom capacity and potential travel restrictions may interfere with the victims and the defendant's family's ability to observe the court proceedings in this case. There you go. That's a little better. Therefore, in the event that they are unable or prefer not to attend the proceeding in person, the court finds it necessary to make the court proceedings available via Zoom for the victims and the defendant's immediate family members under the following restrictions. The victims and the defendant's immediate family members may observe the court proceedings in person or via Zoom. You can see they've redacted the meeting ID and the passcode. Zoom information shall not be disseminated to anyone other than the victims and the defendant's immediate family members, and any recording or live streaming of the proceeding is prohibited. But there will be cameras in the courtroom. So it's kind of like the West trial, you know, there's going to, or like Lori Vallow, I suppose. Well, that was audio only, but there will be cameras in the courtroom. I believe that Court TV has exclusive rights on those cameras, from what I'm hearing. Either way, once all three proceedings are done, maybe they'll release it after the first one is done, the arraignment. Some of these mainstream media uh, channels like Court TV would uh, probably be releasing their footage of it. Are we able to stream it live? No. Are they able to stream it live? No. Have I made myself clear? <laughs> and everyone's always like, oh, we're going to stream it. What are we going to do? No, now you know. We're not going to because we can't. Moving on. So this is the episode, okay? Two hour special, about 90 minutes. So now let's, I've, I've put some bullet points here for you guys so that we can discuss them. Let me take this branding off so it's nicer to see. So when they asked um, one of uh, the girl's friends, Kaylee, Zana, Maddie, what do most of you use for apps on like social media? We all know the answer if you are you know, part of 2023 and the apps, right? T TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. So it's not like an unexpected answer. 
it was just good to ask like, so what apps do you use? Because why would they be asking that question? Obviously, because they want to know, well, where could the suspect have stalked them, right? And that is quite a possibility as well, even if he didn't follow them. In this episode, they actually said he didn't follow any of them. He did apparently, remember, it's been out there saying that he apparently had said hello, hi, hi, hi to, I don't know how people say to Maddie. I don't know how they connect those dots, but to one of the victims, but we just don't know that concretely. Anyway, they did say predators understand the power of social media. Now that I put in italics there for us, because we all need to know that too. Make sure you know that, yeah, for you, for your kids, for anyone you know, social media is generally not a safe space. We talked about that earlier in that members only stream. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, predators understand the power of social media. So even if they're just lurking, yeah, they could, they literally could stalk you from a distance. You know what I mean? Anonymous says, Keith Morrison, second all-time fave. And G, first fave. Oh, my word. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're like, obviously. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to get into the second bullet point in a moment. AP says, thank you, G. Marina Bulter, I'm sorry I have to. If you rather me, not please tell me. I just want to spread her name. I'd rather focus on what I'm focusing on now. I very much struggle to look left and right at different cases. So please email me things. I don't even know what that's about right now. But thank you so much for your sticker. Okay, yes, and it's Dateline NBC, you guys. A former friend of Koberger, Casey Arns, said that Koberger was picked on at school. Now, that was nothing new. I'm going to say this. <laughs> it sounds braggy, but I'm not trying to brag. <laughs> but a lot of what was discussed is already on the playlist here at Grizzly True Crime. We did such a deep dive on this case that a lot of this... I would just say actually on, on YouTube, a lot of YouTubers, we've discussed this stuff round and round and round. So it wasn't too much like riveting stuff, but there were some kernels of information, a pinch, a grain, whichever you'd like to call it. Okay. So some information here was very interesting. Now this, I just put there in case you didn't know it. Um, I'm referring you as well to episodes where you can look, you can deep dive this on the Idaho College Murders or the Idaho 4 playlist that I made for you. So they said Dateline went over... Koberger's visual snow posts. Wow, we saw the visual snow posts again. <laughs> remember those? I hope you remember them. If you're not familiar with the case, please do check out the playlist. It is linked in the description box for you. But the one quote that they they got from there, which they shared, again, there's many of them that are very interesting, is Brian, they, they say it's most likely Brian Koberger, and it seems to be. I think that's been vetted already, that that was him, right? So he said, I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. Like, damn, bro. That is quite a quote he had there. He also said, which I think is, uh, wow, look at that typo. A shish colleagist. <laughs> wow, okay. I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. Other quotes were, I feel like a criminal walking around. And just all kinds of stuff. I do have it um, pinned there. I'll put it in the description box if you want to go over all those again. Forensic psychologist observed that Koberger did everything for people to like him, which we've also gone over with a criminal profiler, John Kelly, in many episodes where Koberger, he'd lost a bunch of weight. He started um, lifting uh, weights. He took up martial arts. He studied hard. He got his degree and all this kind of stuff. Like he seemed to just really overachieve, you know? because he wanted people to like him. That's, of course, speculation. And I must say, some people are a little bit upset with the Dateline episode, as much as they enjoy it, because a lot is speculation. You know, there's a lot of speculation, but there's some things that are so interesting, because, of course, Dateline does have interesting sources. They can speak directly to the police at times or interview people that are very close to either the investigation or the victims or, you know. So there's some things that are very interesting. And I hope you do find it interesting. Hello, dear Ray. Deadline is designed for the normal person, not crime obsessed like us. <laughs> yes, it's a it's not as a deep of a dive, but there's some things that can we add, we can add to our deep dive. So in his visual snow post, he also said, there we go, that he felt like a criminal roaming the streets. It was speculated that he may have had an intense fantasy of leveling the playing field. So that also comes from a forensic psychologist who I wrote the name down and I just don't want to say it wrong. Dr. Gary Bucato, I think that's how he said. He was on the episode and he said he said he may have had an intense fantasy of leveling the playing field, of feeling slighted or rejected, things like that, and wanting to 
level the playing field. College classmates said that he was odd, that he was awkward. And there was a blonde classmate that said that he would stare at her. She said, I would catch him staring at me. It wasn't like super creepy is what she said, but she didn't notice it. And she's like, okay, that's just Brian being Brian. But it was awkward. It was odd. They found it a little bit strange, but they thought it's just a Coburger is just a little bit strange. And he could still just be a little bit strange. He is innocent till proven guilty in a court of law. Okay. So, yeah, Dr. Bucato. Thank you. I actually spelled that right then. Okay. In my scribbles here. Took lots of notes for you guys. Okay. And then. Kerry Rawson, Dennis Raider's daughter, otherwise known as BTK, was also featured on the episode. And she's now a victim's advocate. If you don't follow her on Twitter, you should check out her handle as well. Because she does advocate for a lot of victims, for missing persons, and does a lot of interviews. So she was also on there. Koberger uh, studied violent crime under Professor Ramsland. We did a deep dive on that. And yes, part of the learning material was her book, Confessions of a Serial Killer. So yes. I'm just looking at what you guys are saying. Yes, JC says he wanted to settle the score, which is what they're saying there about speculating that maybe he had this intense fantasy of leveling the playing field. Welcome to Joseph. Welcome to membership. If you're joining today, make sure you check out the stream from earlier today. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Maxi Doodle says, lots of YouTubers, not Gizla, are full of misinformation to our trust dateline. Yes. Okay. They also did bring up that Papa Roger account. If you follow the case closely, you know what I'm talking about. There was a Facebook account called Papa Roger. And Papa Roger had said, he talked about the K-Bar knife, that profile. And the profile stopped being active after Brian Koberger was arrested. The profile picture sort of resembles Koberger as well. There's even connections drawn. This is now on sleuthing on, you know, like social media that Papa Roger could be some type of tribute to Elliot Roger. You know, the incel and all that. So, but I don't know. That that just that's a rabbit hole I've been down and didn't stay in there. However, what I do want to say is they say Papa Roger could have been Koberger, right? Because he's the only one who knew about the knife sheath. Because he's saying, well, police are looking for a K-bar knife, and it must be because they found the knife sheath. But the thing is, there's many people in this community in the early days of this case that said that. That seems logical. Like, how are police looking for a K-bar? And why do we know they were looking for a K-bar before they actually said they were looking for a K-bar? It's because a shop owner in Moscow, Idaho, spoke to the media and said, well, they came into the shop and they were actually looking for a K-bar, but we don't sell those. So already from early days, we were like, well, how would they be looking for a K-bar based on injuries? And even right here in the live stream chat, a few people have said, well, maybe they found the knife sheath or maybe they found like a slip for it or something. So I don't find it that odd. I'm still on the fence about Papa Rogers being Koberger or not. I, yeah, exactly. Jesse Lynn says Papa Rogers was debunked, not Brian. The problem is a lot of things that were debunked, it's still in the social media world. You know, where they're like, no, it's definitely not him. It's kind of like different schools of thought. Yes, it's him. No, it's him. We don't have concrete evidence, but I just, I just have never really believed it's him, you know? Even though it could be. <laughs> Welcome, Nurse Jones. Okay, so... Yes, we've done that. Sorry, let's carry on. Moving forward, hurry up. <laughs> Wait. Oh, yeah. It was speculated that he had a, and again, I say it was speculated. They just stated it, but it was speculated that he had a disdain for women that he couldn't have or women he, that he felt that did not appreciate him. That's pure speculation. That's what we all assume, but we, we don't know that as fact because we don't even know if he is the guy, but we think he could be the guy. He's just a suspect, right? Innocent or proven guilty. But it's ob obviously it's speculated, you know? That can be speculated with a lot of killers, serial killers, abusers, all of that. It was matter-of-factly stated. Now, this was interesting. We didn't know this before. But they matter-of-factly stated that a source close to the investigation, I think they even said they spoke to the police. They said the police said that Koberger had bought a K-Bar knife and a sheath on Amazon. Now, I don't know if they're getting that from the search warrants and all that. Remember that? We listed everything. Could be. But they're saying when he was still at home, before he moved out there, he bought a K-Bar knife and a sheath on Amazon. Do you believe it or no? 
that was just stated just like that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, up to that point, we haven't really known that he did buy, for sure, a K-Bar knife and sheath. We still got to be careful. Maybe it's like 90% true. <laughs> right? So the forensic psychologist, Dr. Bucato, said... It's like being a casting agent that finds someone who looks the part. Now, I said that because he said um, killers like this in the Idaho quadruple homicide. If you don't know about the case, please check the description box to just quickly refresh yourself, right? November 13th, 2022, four University of Idaho students murdered in their off-campus college home. Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan. So, when they say like being a casting agent that finds someone who looks the part... They've said things like that as well, for example, with Ted Bundy. A lot of people have said that his victims looked a lot like his ex-girlfriend who rejected him, who broke up with him. So they were kind of going down that rabbit hole with this of like, hmm, could be finding a prototype, is even how they refer to it in this episode. A prototype who represents somebody who could have rejected him in the past, something he's, he just can't get over, he's festering over, and so he's he's got his knife, he's fantasizing, and... They say, like being a casting agent that finds someone who looks the part. Could be true. Could be pure speculation, yes. ASB412 says, they got into his Amazon account. He purchased the knife and sheath. That's what they said on the episode, yes. <laughs> Jane says, imagine what BK's, um, Brian Kober, uh, Google search history is like. Imagine it, especially because he was a criminal justice PhD student. Welcome, Jan Brooks, to membership. Koberger, classmates, oh, sorry, not classmates, students, right? Because he was a teaching assistant, said he applied his PhD standards to his students. We already know that he belittled women, he was harsh with them, he spoke down to them, all that stuff, right? But the this was a male student saying he applied his PhD standards to his students and he wanted them to read his mind. That's what this guy said, which I found quite interesting as well. We haven't yet heard someone say he wanted us to read his mind. So that's quite a sadistic little game in my mind that he's playing, right? Don't you think? Um, Anonymous says he researched. BK was calculated attempting to pull off a getaway with a perfect murder strategy. Could be so. Could be. You really messed up then leaving that sheet there, right? So Kaylee's friend also wondered if maybe Koberger saw Maddie and Zana at the Mad Greek restaurant. That's something... Again, from like early days, we speculated because Brian was vegan or is vegan. He's apparently still vegan. Yes, in prison. He's probably eating beans and rice. Okay. And maybe oranges if he gets that, if he's lucky. Point is, the Mad Greek restaurant, while not an official vegan restaurant, serves vegan food. So if you go vegan food, Moscow, Idaho, it's the first restaurant that pops up. We know that Maddie and Zana worked at the Mad Greek restaurant. So we all speculated maybe he saw them there for the first time and then started, this is again speculation, stalking them. But it was interesting to hear that um, their friends also said that. Yeah. <laughs> Rochelle says, the mind reader. I wonder what he's thinking in his own mind right now. I think he's thinking he's eager to be exonerated. Or he's probably... As John Kelly, the criminal profiler, said, probably stressing a lot. He's just going over and over and over everything all day, every day, all the time. If you don't know who John Kelly is, check out my episodes with him. He's spoken to quite a few serial killers in his lifetime. And he said, like, they do feel fear. You know, they might not feel remorse, but they do feel fear. And he he might be, Brian Koberger might be, if he's, I know he's just the suspect. If he did this, he would be obsessing over the mistakes he made, right? Which is like the obvious one. So that's what we have there. Let's carry on. <laughs> Joseph is like oranges, funny. Now they have this quote here where they said he could have been stalking them on social media, lurking basically, right? And they said sharing an intimacy that doesn't exist. That's again just a side lesson of the dangers of social media. We've seen it like in the Delphi case, things like that. Many cases, the dangers of social media exist. And sometimes lurkers could feel that they share an intimacy that doesn't exist. It doesn't even have to be just lurkers. It could be 
whoever online is generally not a safe space. So just be careful what you share, like especially with your location on. A lot of people are like location on, check in. I've been listening to the Crime Analyst podcast and there's a story there of a woman. It's a, I'm not going to go into the deep story now because I'll be, be here forever with that. But the point is she had her location on. So her abuser was like, what the hell are you doing there? And she's like, how do you know I'm there? He's like, I can see it on Facebook. It's right there. Your location is right there. So things like that. Not Don't have your location on. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was such a good quote. Wildfire says, social media is sharing an intimacy that doesn't exist. So true. Yes. And this society, I mean, especially after COVID and all that, wow, a lot of humanity relies on social media for connection. I mean, here I am as a YouTuber, right? <laughs> but it's very dangerous, I think. You have to be careful because it's sharing an intimacy that doesn't exist. Yes. His phone data showed that he was in the vicinity of the home 12 times before the crime was committed, close enough to connect to the Wi-Fi. So they also stated that, which I find interesting, because before we heard Kaylee's dad say that, we're like, close enough to connect to the Wi-Fi. So I wonder if they have proof that he connected to the Wi-Fi of 1122 King Road, right? It was speculated that it's highly likely that Koberger committed other crimes in the past. And now that, if he's the one who did it, or whoever did this crime, yeah, we would speculate that, right? And you know what still bothers me? Even though Murphy, the dog, was left safe in Kaylee's room, is that other dog, which wasn't his name Buddy? So, okay, trigger warning. Okay, the, the dog Buddy that was um, was an Australian shepherd, right? That was uh, killed and skinned and all that. Oh, that, that, that was a weird crime. And it might be completely unrelated, but that and then the coyote carcasses and all this kind of stuff it might just be pranks and a weirdo or whatever but that <laughs> it still bugs me that stuff but either way they say it's speculated it's highly likely that he committed other crimes in the past because one doesn't just wake up it was um an investigator greg agent greg cooper said you don't just wake up and then one day like okay i'm just gonna commit a quadruple homicide he would probably have fantasized a lot the killer would probably have fantasized a lot about this, practiced, maybe done some other crimes. Yes. <laughs> Ray's like, who wants my social security number? <laughs> no, Ray. You stop that. Yeah, and Wildfire says animal torture is so serial killer. I know there's a lot of speculation um, about other crimes committed either in Pennsylvania or also around that area there in Idaho. So... Who knows? Yes. Yes, I remember that as well. The G family private investigator uh, said that about BK connecting to the King Road uh, Wi-Fi. Yes. Okay. T Rev, welcome to the stream. You say episode was very interesting. I also find it interesting. Yes. Okay, March 2022. Now this was very interesting. Oh my word! They said in March 2022. So I just put it the other way around compared to because I was first watching it like, but how do they know? How do they? <laughs> I don't know if you guys do that. If you're watching an episode, you also like talk to the screen. How do you know? Or like, how do you know this? Like, okay, okay, buddy, let's hear what you got to say. <laughs> anyway, this is March 2022. No one really knows where Coburg was because he was studying online. He was still in Pennsylvania from what we know, but studying online to Sales University before he went to WSU. So they say reference was made to the body cam from the area. We've looked at all of that before. It's on the playlist, right? When a girl's bag was found outside of her car, I don't know if you remember this, and her underwear was taken out of the bag and stashed in the cup holder, but the girl pointed to the side panel of the car, so I just said side panel of the car. That was so weird, and this happened in March of 2022. So while, see, I was like, well, how can that be related? Because he wasn't there. But it's a good point that nobody actually knows where he was. The only point I would make is that there's a lot more weirdos than one might think <laughs> out there. So it doesn't just have to be Koberger that did this, but it would be interesting. Because, for example, serial killers, not that I'm saying he is one, they could do this type of thing. They could be trying to, I don't know, steal underwear or something or, you know, take trophies or items or practice or whatever it is. So this, this girl, college student, not at 1122 King Road, it's actually next door. She had a bag full of clothes in her car. That bag was found outside of the car, like on the road the next day. And she's like, that's so weird because I put it in the car. And then when she opens the car door, 
her underwear stashed in that side panel. That's just so weird. Oh my word. Yes, that's true. Enola uh, says he also applied. Did I put that there? I think it's on here somewhere. But he did apply for that job. The oh, what's it called now? <laughs> Why am I losing this word? He applied for that job. Yes, in uh, the internship. There we go, at the Pullman Police Department in March. And he also applied for that job for the teaching assistant and going there for his PhD in March. So he could have been there to check out the area. It's just quite an odd crime then crime or an odd behavior to do at that time. Right. But anyway, it's not impossible. So they say, yeah, there we go. Koberger had already applied to WSU and to the Pullman PD as an intern. Could he have done all these creepy things? What do you think? Meg says, wouldn't a creep take them though? Usually I would say yes. But you see, what if it's someone that's just trying to create a bit of fear, a little bit of, it sounds like almost like playtime for this type of person, right? Just toying with people. What do you think? Yeah, wildfire says practice and getting more confident, bolder, creepy. That's it. Daniel says that was the neighbor who later purchased the ring cam that caught BK on camera. And that caught the audio, right? Like the thud and the whimpering and all that kind of stuff. Not the one that was leaked and proven to be false. Not that one. The actual audio the police say they have based on the probable cause affidavit. Yes. Yeah. High on love. Mind games. That's what I'm thinking. Koberger. Now, this one was interesting, too. They say Koberger befriended a woman who was on the PhD program. So he connected with this lady. One day, she noticed that things in her apartment had been moved. So who does she call? Her new friend, Brian Koberger, to come and take a look. What does he do? Now, I wrote there, it said that he knew a Wi-Fi password, but let me expand on that. Stand by. There we go. Okay, so Koberger goes there as the hero, the man. He might have been the one. Agent Greg Cooper said he probably orchestrated this whole thing. That's, again, speculation, but pretty plausible. When he went there, he said, I'm going to check it out. And then he recommended she installs a security camera. He helped her install the security camera, and he had her Wi-Fi password. So it was said that then after that day, he could watch her. <laughs> he could watch her apartment because he had the password. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's, it was said that he knew her Wi-Fi password. It was speculated that he likely orchestrated the whole thing, and he would do this to feel like a hero or have the power or dominance or control that he was looking for. That was like, sorry, what now? He did what? So here, let's just see. This is, wait, wait, hold on. I just want to find a different one. No, not that one. Okay, we'll go with this, but skip the headline because it's a little bit dramatic. So this is a Daily Mail article. They say suspected killer Brian Koberger allegedly broke into a female colleague's apartment and moved items around to get her to ask for his help. You see, now they're taking a leap. Okay, but it's speculated. To get her to ask for his help before installing security cameras. The 28-year-old criminology student had befriended a woman at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, according to Dateline. The alleged incidents took place months before the brutal killings of University of Idaho students Katie Consolves, Madison Mogan, Zana Kunodal, and Ethan Chapin on November 13th last year. Koberger is suspected of breaking into the property and moving items around, which again goes with the toying with people, you see? So if he's toying with people in this way, it's plausible that he could have toyed with someone in March by, you know, taking, putting a bag outside the car, putting the underwear there. It's just weird staging things, right? The woman who has not, oh, so they say, sorry, not stealing anything, which resulted in his colleague contacting him instead of the police. The woman who's not been identified asked the suspected killer to come over to assist her. And he reportedly suggested that she install a surveillance system in the property. Here is ex FBI profiler Greg Cooper, who was also on the episode. Absolutely brilliant. Dateline claims that he offered to put the video network, put in the video network, which he agreed to, though now authorities believe that he could have accessed it remotely because he knew her Wi-Fi password. I would have no doubt then that he would do that, right? Ex FBI profiler Greg Cooper claims that the incident was a step in the progression of Koberger's alleged offending, indicating that he was upping the ante. He told Dateline, I would expect that he orchestrated the whole thing. He was not looking at her as a potential victim necessarily. 
Denise Parker, thank you so much for your 999 super sticker. That is a good point someone makes there. Colonel Russell Williams, you remember that guy? He also started off as like a loco, a peeping Tom, and then stealing underwear, and things escalate and escalate, and the next minute, they're killers. It's possible. It doesn't mean all of them do it. Not all peeping Toms do it. But they do. The statistics are actually quite high for peeping Toms to commit violent crimes. Voyeurs, right? Voyeurism, peeping Toms. Yes. So they say the hero image that he can portray, you've got this problem. I'm here to solve the problem for you and make it better for you. The NBC special also revealed that Koberger had reportedly bought a K-bar knife and sheath in April of 2022. Well, they said March, right? Anyway, before he moved to Washington. Oh, no, they said April, yeah. Before he moved to Washington to attend the university. He had still been studying at the Sales University in Pennsylvania, but Dateline sources claim that he purchased the knife, which cops say is the murder weapon, and took it with him when he moved. Damn. So ex-FBI agent Cooper said he had a fantasy of thinking about committing crimes for a long time with that knife, and he had become familiar with it, feel at ease with it. Okay. Which is also... I'm just giving criminal profiler John Kelly some credit here. He said the same, and he actually described it as, I think I've got it somewhere here. There we go. The weapon was described in the same way the criminal profiler John Kelly described it, which is pickerism. Remember we looked at pickerism? If you've never heard of pickerist or picker, pickerism, go check it out. Google it quick. Uncle Google will tell you what it is. We've gone over it quite a bit. Or check out the episodes with John Kelly on the Idaho playlist I've made for you. Now, why would he leave the knife sheath there? It was speculated by... The forensic psychologist, Greg Bucato, that it could be because of stress. I mean, as much as one might fantasize about this and plan this and everything, go the, uh, the stress. <laughs> maybe, maybe the killer didn't plan for all the stress they were going to experience. The adrenaline and or a dissociative blip. Now, let's hope Dr. Lewis from the Letitia Stark trial doesn't hear this because then she'll be on this case like, yes, okay, definitely he's got DID. So... Careful with that, but <laughs> it could be adrenaline, stress, and or a dissociative blip. You know, that it's he's like so focused on what he's doing upstairs. And they do believe he went upstairs first, which means he would have murdered Kaylee and Maddie first. And then come downstairs. Former FBI agent uh, Jennifer Coffinduffer was also on the episode. And she said that she thinks that that he killed that the killer killed Ethan and Zanna because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But then I would argue, okay, but then why walk right past DM? Why walk right past the person who saw him unless he didn't see her? But that's a bit odd, right? Just to walk right past with the bushy eyebrows clad in black. Because that would definitely be wrong place, wrong time. Or is that just for like exhaustion or what is it? You know what I mean? Wow. David, uh, MC says, do you think others could be involved? I have speculated that before. We've gone down the whole Kopaka rabbit hole. So if you want to go down that deep dive, it was a very long stream, but I would recommend you check it out. It was time stamped. We looked at a lot of factors, which were pretty interesting in my opinion. <laughs> at the time, people thought I was like, what, like, what is she saying? But later, yeah, that, that, that rabbit hole got a lot more people in it. <laughs> Of like, wait, what What now? Because that SWAT team incident just always interested me. Of the timing and just how it happened. Just the everything. So could it? I would speculate it could be. It could be possible. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, so that's what we got. Yeah, maybe he didn't see her. Especially if he's struggling with visual snow, you guys. Um, Crime Circus, Drip Drop actually said that. If you don't know who Crime Circus is, then where have you been? So he's done quite a deep dive on this case as well. He's got a series on it. And he was saying, well, if you think of the visual snow and if his peripheral vision, especially under stress, because the stress and adrenaline makes visual snow. If you don't know what visual snow is, again, Uncle Google, okay? We've gone through that before, right? But it could make his peripheral vision not so good, compromised. And maybe he could only see, you know, literally tunnel vision and he left without seeing DM standing there in that doorway just peeping out. Right? It's possible. Yeah, okay. Rock, every rock everything. So someone said the DM's room door could have looked like a closet by the way the house is set up. Could be. 
So why would the suspect say, don't worry, I'm going to help you? That is based on the probable cause affidavit and what DM said she heard. She heard someone say, don't worry, I'm going to help you. And what Dr. Greg uh, Bucato said was maybe that could have been an attempt to control the victim. That could have been why they say that. Actually, I can't remember if it was Agent Cooper or Greg Bucato, but one of them on this episode said it was perhaps an attempt to control the victim to say, don't worry, I'm going to help you. And it could also be his same tactic with that um, classmate where he installed the security cameras, like, I'm the hero, I'm going to help you. You know what I mean? Could be that. Why would he murder Zana and Ethan and leave DM and BF? So that we already did this, speculated that things didn't, oh yeah, they speculated that things didn't go according to his plan or fantasy. It wasn't how he envisioned it in his mind so many times. If you didn't know, I wrote four true crime books. One is on Ted Bundy. And there they specifically highlighted in all the things I read about Ted Bundy that he said that he would like think about, a lot of serial killers do, right? They would obsess and think about how the murder was going to play out. And they would get very upset if it didn't go according to plan, if they never committed the perfect murder according to their fantasy, if the victims didn't, you know, behave the way that they had envisioned. So it was speculated that maybe maybe at that point he just left because things didn't go according to plan. Maybe it felt a little bit botched. Burkato. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Gary Burkato. Uh, Joseph Eastman, thank you so much for your $20 super sticker. Rochelle, thank you so much. Brilliant mod over here. <laughs> Sharing visual snow is a form of visual hallucination that is characterized by the perception of small, bilateral, simultaneous, yes, uh, diffuse, mobile, mobile, asynchronous dots, usually throughout the entire visual field. You should definitely check out uh, Drip Drop's episode on the visual snow because he actually did a an overlay which shows then how it would look if you suffered from this visual snow. Why would a killer feel that they possess a victim by killing them was one of the questions that was posed in this episode. And the answer was that they, <laughs> they're bound together in history. It's the feeling of ultimate control. Then in all search history, especially today with all this online stuff, their name will forever be attached to the victim's names. And that is very sad, actually. It is. If you ever type in Kaylee Consolves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Koberger is going to, okay, sorry. Koberger will come up, but he's innocent until proven guilty. So <laughs> when they eventually, you know, have the, the killer and, and he's convicted and all that, then you know what I mean? If it's him that did it, yeah, the name will always be attached. LJD3 says, in my opinion, Brian doesn't actually have visual snow. I do wonder, I, I, in my opinion, I think he could have it just because he wrote the, those posts when he was about 15 years old. And he went into great detail describing a whole bunch. And it would be, I don't know, because he wasn't studying um, you know, criminal justice yet. Although he did say, friends did say he liked uh, true crime and police shows and magazines and stuff. So, I mean, so did all of we read. <laughs> But we don't have we don't we don't have that, and we're not in in jail. We are not killers. Not that he is; he's innocent or proven guilty. But anyway, my point is, when he was a teenager, he wrote this. This is it. Um, by the way, if you didn't know, this is it. It's tappertalk.com, and this is the profile XR those with visual snow, and there's many pages of all the stuff that he had said here, right? And he's giving people advice on it, and he's talking about. All kinds of things that it's from cause from toxins in the body and all kinds of solutions to try to help that. But yeah, let me know if you think, do you think he had visual snow? I think he could have had it. Yes, JC says presumed innocent, indicted by a grand jury. <laughs> Bridget, welcome to membership. Okay, Christina says my daughter has a diagnosed case of visual snow via Mayo Clinic, the top researcher of the condition. Peripheral, not an issue. But if it was dark, okay, if it was dark, and it could have been quite dark, right, depending on what lights were in the house, but it was early hours of the morning. Yes. Okay, so let's continue on here. We understand. So just remember, 
that everything that I'm presenting here, I'm just breaking down the things that were said on the Dateline episode. We cannot assume that it's fact. That's why a lot of times I say speculation and they speculate and they speculatively said. I'm just breaking down what I saw there, what I heard there, what I found quite interesting. We don't know <laughs> that it's factual, especially there's a gag order in place. Remember that as well. But some things they mentioned, very matter-of-factly, were quite interesting. Yes. So why was Koberger pulled over twice on his trip home? And they're like, Dateline can exclusively reveal this now. I'm like, what is it? And they said it was routine drug checks. And they were actually, the cops were looking for unusual or erratic driving behavior, like going really fast and then slowing down or making sure there's always a car between them or doing kinds of all kinds of weird driving. And that's why they, he got pulled over twice because he, of his <laughs> unusual erratic driving behavior. So if you don't know what we're talking about, we've also shared those uh, those videos. It's on the playlist as well, where he's like, we're going for Thai food. Remember that one? Block Yellow said, did they address the several hours before the police were called? They did not. There were many things actually not addressed. I mean, the little the grub truck video they showed for a few seconds. They didn't talk about the corner club, the timeline, where everyone was at the time, you know, all of that stuff. Um, only the one friend they asked, well, when did you hear about this? When did you hear anything? And that friend said, well, I got a text and a call from a friend. And I was like, this can't be real. Like, what is it? And then she tried to contact Kaylee, where she said she obviously didn't answer. And then that was all that she said. So the timeline there wasn't really given. So they said DNA led to, from the knife sheath, right? DNA test led to a small list of names on a forensic genealogy search, which led then to a search warrant of his phone, which they then said was a treasure trove of information showing that he was at the home close enough to connect to the Wi-Fi in that area more than 12, or 12 times before the murder was committed and all of that. The one little thing led to so many other things, right? Now, this was interesting. They said one of his sisters thought it was odd that he was wearing latex gloves at home. See, I find that super interesting because when they said he was arrested, they said he was standing in the kitchen wearing latex gloves and putting his trash into Ziploc baggies, which would obviously be to protect his DNA, right? Because in the trash that they dug through, they only could match that DNA in the trash to his father's, right? Which they said... The DNA, I hope I'm not botching this. Hold on. The DNA on the knife sheath would have been familiarly linked to the trash. So they said it was very likely the father of the person's DNA on the knife sheath. There you go. So at that time, we were saying, but what if he always did this? What if for years he wore these gloves at home and he just was pedantic like that? But to hear that one of his sisters thought it was odd that he was wearing latex gloves at home, I'm like, oh, so that's that's behavior that only started later, like after the murders, right? Very interesting. That really piqued my interest. So they said, she also thought like, hmm, but he came home recently and there's a white Elantra. So she thought that he may have been responsible and actually brought it up in a conversation at the dinner table. And apparently his dad didn't believe that this was possible, that it could be Brian. But she was like, huh, she had her suspicions. They also just mentioned, which I don't know who saw this. I don't know if it was a neighbor or the family or whatever, but they said that um, he had cleaned the Elantra with bleach. Also, the family, after that conversation, were all a little bit rattled, a little bit concerned. And they said they went, they searched outside of the house and in the Elantra for evidence and found none. So they definitely had their suspicions. Okay, so correction, in the Dateline episode, they mentioned very briefly the corner club, the grab truck. They just didn't mention any of the other um, people, you know, like the hoodie guy and like social media zoning in on the hoodie guy and all the other. Remember, there was like Jack123 and this one and that one and where they all went and the frat party and all that. There was It wasn't like that detailed with that timeline, right? Okay, but this was, don't you think this is so interesting? That one of the sisters is like, hmm, he's wearing latex gloves at home. That's odd. Time Timeline, okay. Elantra. 
And the dad's like, nope, nope, I don't think it's him. But then the family goes outside to check for evidence and in their lunch and they couldn't find any, but damn. And then they further say that, yeah, he was cleaning his car with bleach. Wow. <laughs> Liz says, grains of salt. Is it kernels of information? A pinch, a grain, whatever you prefer. That's it. Okay, the only thing, C minor ops says, the only thing about the online Papa Roger, whatever name, the police said the weapon was a fixed knife, but they didn't have the weapon or no autopsy, so you can assume they found a sheath. That's the thing. But the thing is, if you missed the beginning of the stream, where I said this, there was a shop owner that talked to the media that said the police specifically came in and asked about a K-bar knife. Because then we went all down that rabbit hole of the program that they have at the university for marine recruits and all this kind of stuff, right? So that, yes, <laughs> Shelly's like an ocean of salt. <laughs> okay, so let's see what else I've got here. Yes, he cleaned his car with bleach. Then there's also his sister apparently said that he did have two ID cards. Remember they said on the search warrant list that there were ID cards inside a glove box, inside a box, inside the glove compartment. Well, here they said BK Koberger had two ID cards. They were of women, but they were not of any of the victims. That was interesting. Oh, yeah, ID cards. I remember how it was written. People were like 10 cards, or is it ID cards? So ID cards. Yes, that. But they said it wasn't of any of the victims. It wasn't the victims' IDs. But oddly enough, it was two women's ID cards, and that, to me, is a little bit of a red flag. Who are those women, and are they okay? I'm sure by now they would know that, obviously. But, like, hmm, collecting ID cards. We've seen that in true crime cases before, hmm? Okay. Okay, we've got that. So, when he was arrested, yes, he was apparently standing in the kitchen with latex gloves on, putting his trash in Ziploc baggies. Because <laughs> that's not weird at all. And in the middle of the night, I mean, they went in there... At what time did they go again? It was like 1.30 in the morning. Yeah, 1.30. December 30th at 1.30 a.m. Wow. You're standing in the kitchen. That must have been quite a sight to see. His jail mail is uh, rerouted to his attorney, who says he's receiving letters from admirers. We went over that the other day. It's very unfortunate. It would be that disorder is called hybristophilia. It is a disorder. And people who suffer from this need help. Really. Like, oh, my word, admiring him and, oh, no, no, no. It happens in every case, though. Imagine oh, imagine Letitia Stark or Lori Valor receiving letters. Oh, no. Okay, so they said um, the 1122 King Road house will be demolished soon. And then Keith Morrison said a plaque with the victims' names will be placed there. And Jane says, will there be a memorial garden for the Ida for? I don't know. The only thing they mentioned here, which I hadn't heard before, I know the house is going to be demolished soon. That's what they said. But they said a plot where the victims' names will be placed there. So I'm not sure if there would be a garden or a bench or what will there be. So, yes, remembering Zena, Maddie, Ethan, and Kaylee. Okay. So let's just see my notes here as well. Just to make sure I've got everything. Oh, they also said he allegedly entered through the sliding door. That's what we all assume, right? And that he was not following any of the victims on social media. Okay, if you've watched it and if there's anything I missed, let me know. That's the notes that I took from watching it. Uh, Lisa Leo, welcome to membership. <laughs> Enola says, I believe this dateline more so than mainstream media. Should I not? <laughs> I mean, generally, it's very good, yes. Wildfire says, I'm glad families can put things there. Yes, after the house destroyed, they're putting up a memorial. So they just said in this Dateline episode, they set a plaque. So I'm not sure what exactly is. Uh, Peter Pronzo, Harlem Raiders. If you haven't checked out the Harlem Raiders book, check it out. says, we can't forget BK was a criminal justice student. Mm-hmm. I'm just checking what you guys are saying. I'm not T-Pain, says the victims were everything you wanted to be. He had complete hatred for them being cool and popular. Speculatively, yes. Okay. 
So, Anonymous says, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> please not. But wait, as our infamous Dr. Dorothy Lewis weighed in on diagnosis of Koberger, yet joke, joke, pause for a collective grizzly lol. Well, especially when I talked about the dissociative blip, I'm like, oh no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of notes. Uh, Sandra Bell said, uh, Sandra LeBell, sorry, said, I read it was going to be a memorial garden. I'd also read that before, but I think a lot of people have said it's going to be a garden. It's going to be a bench. It's going to be this. I, I think there were a lot of ideas being thrown around. I'd love to see what's actually going to happen. I hope it's really beautiful. I hope it, you know, I hope it will be, oh man, it's such a painful thing, right? Though, like that area where the house was and just to destroy the house and just everything. It's just, oh my word, unbelievable. This crime is unbelievable. It's one of those where we will never forget. A quadruple homicide. I mean, two 20-year-olds and two 21-year-olds. What? And this is most likely a stranger to them that committed this. That is so scary. Going in there in the middle of the night. What? Like four in the morning? Oh, my word. So, thank you so much all for uh, going through some of the latest documents uh, with me. And knowing that the arraignment of Koberger is on Monday. He's been indicted by a grand jury. He's going to be arraigned on Monday. We can't stream it um, because the Zoom link will only be shared with family members of the victims and the defendants in case they can't make it there. So they've redacted that. So Core TV and possibly a few other media cameras will be in there filming. And then they're going to share it afterwards. So feel free to share me the link. Just I'm probably going to get millions of them. <laughs> I'm sure you guys will. You'll be like, there it is. But once I see it, um, yeah, we could probably watch it together. See what happened there. I'm guessing he's going to plead not guilty, right? Are we guessing the same? Thank you, Tracy, for sharing my Patreon link. Um, if you haven't yet joined Patreon, please do so. There's documents over there for you. Photos are behind the scenes, like all kinds of things. Um, things you might like. So yes, that's there. And all the notifications, of course, for these YouTube live streams in case you ever miss those. Cassandra Lins has made a big mark. Hopefully it'll be beautiful. I hope so. I hope so. Kayla, I don't know. Is he a virgin? I don't know. I don't know. Kazen wants to tell me how to run my channel. Stop. Okay, let's see what you, the Pareto principle or 80-20 rule states 80 percent of outcomes are driven by 20 percent of what effort is that what it says stop thanking everyone for nice words well thank you for your contribution Kazan. i really appreciate it enola gay george um thank you so much for your 20 dollar super sticker yes <laughs> thank you so much you'll tune in okay so i will see you guys probably on monday maybe tomorrow depending on what the news is and what's happening but if you were there at the member stream, you know what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm studying my butt off for a course I'm doing this week. So thank you so much, mods, members, patrons, all subscribers, new subscribers, everyone. Oh, geez. Thank you for being here. And I will see you again very soon. I just want to see one. Nope. That's it. I'll see you again very soon, you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. If you're doing something, stay safe. Okay. Bye.